Hello everyone, welcome back. So we're back into it again this weekend. And as you can see, we've got SBR BA1 on the hoist. And we're gonna have a little bit more of a look at the car, which I'll share with you in this video. I'm actually interested to get your thoughts on this one because this car is vastly different to the super cheap Auto Falcon and FTR3 as far as its history and some of the issues that it's currently carrying. So I'm interested to get your thoughts on how you think it, we should do it and how you would approach it. Because some of them, I guess, are problems that are fairly significant, but it is part of the car's history. So do we leave it? Do we repair it? It's a little bit of an unknown. And as I said, I, we've made decisions on the other two cars previously. You look at this in a different light. So um, I'm interested to get your thoughts. So we're going to um, have a look over the car. We're going to go inside, under the bonnet, underneath it, and have a bit of a look. And it's quite interesting if you look at this car in the light of, you know, coming off the back of an era in 2000, say even 98, all the way through to 2002. It was an era that was dominated by the Holding Racing Team. And then all of a sudden Stone Brothers turned up with their BAs and were very competitive and that era changed and really set the trend moving forward. So you look at this car and the amount of work that Stone Brothers put into it to build it, how different it is from the super cheap Auto Falcon and the FTR Falcon. And you can really see why this car was as successful as it was. So we'll go over it now. I hope you enjoy and we'll climb over SBR BA1. So while the car's on the ground, we thought we'd go over what we can and then we'll pop the car up in the air and have a bit of a look. So as you can see, the log books that came with the car, we've got to make sure that the chassis is what, what it's meant to be. And um, as you can see, it's got the original Stone Brothers markings on it. It's SBR BA1 and then it's got 0103, which marries up with the log book. Now this car actually had two log books given it did so much racing. So um, it filled one and then a second one um, was done. So you can see there, that's a picture of the, that's the original book with the cars. Um, on the car, I should say. As you can see there, it's still partially incomplete in those photos just before Albert Park in 2003. It's got no side skirts on it. Um, yeah, but that's, uh, that's how the car was when it first hit the track. So you've obviously got that Stone Brothers marking there, which is on the left-hand pickup point for the top shock in the engine bay. And if we come around this way, inside the car as well, if you go around the uh, other driver's side rear, it's got a Stone Brothers marking as far as the cage certification. And what's really cool is they did engrave or had a press section at the back on the rear firewall, which is engraved SBR as well. So the presentation of this car is just off the charts considering it was done in 2003. Now we're still piecing together some of the original information on the car. So original drawings and photos, just anything that we can get our hands on. But you can see here, the engine is still a five litre supercar engine. It did race in the Kumo series, Super 2 main game, and it didn't actually change a lot. So um, the good thing is from an originality point of view, a lot of it seems to have survived. You can see a lot of the tanks and everything based on the photos we have got are still in the original positions. Even down to the bonnet pins, you have a look at the perches that were fabricated up to hold the pins in the center. A lot of that could have easily been done away with over time, but um, yeah, or, or changed, but it's, um, they still survive today, which is really cool. A little bit beaten up, but they are still there. Now the airbox on the car looks to still be original. Now I'll go through it all with you now, but you can see there there's nice little latches that have been um, put on them and a strap at the back to hold it all down. And that molding at the front there, that's where the air cleaner sits. So your induction comes in the front of the car and that's your, your um, air filter to filter all the air. Obviously trumpets and everything are all under that. So I'll pop the air box off now and we'll have a little bit of a look. So the air box is off and one thing you never get sick of looking at are these inlet trumpets and throttle bodies. The way the teams had different theories and different approaches to this, you really appreciate the amount of time and effort that was put into this back in the day. Now you can see there it looks a lot more current than say the super cheap Auto Falcon, which we'll run over and have a look at in a sec. But you can see here the airbox is quite big. But one, th one thing that's really interesting is if you recall or you've been following the journey, when we got FTR3, it was rebuilt as a BA Falcon to be used as a ride car. Now that had a full ProDrive engine in it, 
Pro Drive Airbox, everything that dated back to 2003 and 2004. Now that's the, the air induction setup for the airbox. So you can see there it's in the shape of a BA grill and that's sat tucked in under the front grill of their Falcons. Now you can see here, stones have it completely blanked off and what they've done is it draws air from the main radiator intake. So if we have a look down in there, you can see there that there's nothing behind the grill. It's all completely open and all the air supply, so that's your air filter there, all your air supply came from that main feed that goes through the radiator. So it's really, I guess, really interesting way of looking at it because if you have a look at the restriction on this FTR setup, if we move that, there's obviously the air has to do a bend in around to the two feeds to the air box. And there's also not a huge area where the air can come through through the grill. And then you, obviously you have a look at the size of the intake on the Stones Falcon and it's massive. So there's obviously been updates and theories and it's just interesting to see, I guess, how the teams approach things because the Stone Brothers Falcons were known for their horsepower and they had it fairly well worked out. Now, if you have a look here, you look at the trumpets, they're dead straight, um, really neat and tidy. Again, the system survived over 20 years. You go back to the super cheap Auto Falcon, which again was a seriously strong engine in a straight line, and the trumpets have got a curve in them, and they're totally different how they're all mounted, how the fuel rails all mount up. It's just a really different system. This is an Alan Jones racing engine, which we've covered previously, which Stone Brothers were involved in before they became Stone Brothers Racing. So it's really interesting just to see how over, which wasn't a long time, like, 1997, 98 that Alan Jones racing engine dates back to. And then you go to 2003 with Stone Brothers. There was a lot of development done in a very short amount of time. Now, as you know, these cars were the, I guess, set the standard for this era of supercars. They were both a race winning chassis, championship winning chassis. So you can see here, a lot of bar work and a lot of effort had gone in to stiffen up the front of the car. You look at the bars and the cross work that's going on into the front shock towers and then when you have a look at the AU era, in fairness this car was four years before 1999 but it's, uh, there's not anywhere near the amount of bar work that's gone into the engine bay. Now if we come around this way, you can see the side intrusion again is a lot more complex but inside the car the presentation is just off the charts. And it's, everything's functional. You can see all the switches are laid out beautifully. They're all marked. All your circuit breakers, you can reach them easily. The adjusters or the, the um, anti-roll bar adjusters are easy to get to, marked out. Everything's just really neat, tidy and functional. Even little details like the Motec dash is actually recessed into the carbon fibre where all the other cars that have, um, you know, that are certainly here anyway, have just been mounted on onto a flat bit of carbon. So. It's um, a lot of effort's gone into making them look good as well as perform. Now, one thing that's quite interesting, you sit a lot more inboard on this car. If you have a look at the gap between the side intrusion and the seat, there's actually quite a bit of space. Now, that's a little park brake lever just to get the car off the line as well. And that just operates off a cable and it pushes the brake pedal down, which you can see there, which is a pretty cool little addition. But... You can certainly see the drivers are a lot more inboard on this generation of car compared to the uh, the AU era. Now, one other thing that's really interesting, Stone Brothers built their own pedal boxes. So you, if you have a look at the Super Cheap Auto Falcon, which we've covered previously, it's got what they call a hanging pedal setup. So the pedals hang from the top. The FPR Falcon's got a full tilt and pedal box in it. This is a fully custom built system by Stone Brothers. Now, in underneath there, um, obviously, we'll get all those that foot tray off and have a bit of a look um, and get in there and have a look when we get to that stage. But it'll be very interesting to see how they've done it again because it was a very successful idea. Um, the brake bias adjusters just mounted up on the dash there. So a lot of it does survive today, which is really cool. And it's uh, something we're really looking forward to preserving. One other interesting note with this car Stone Brothers did develop later on a hydraulic system for their anti-roll bars. As you can see, this car still has the cable system in it. 
So their cars in the majority had a hydraulic system which was far more reliable. This car was never updated. It stayed, it was built with the, the cable system. It stayed with its entire life and it's what's in the car today. So it's really cool to know that there's a nice piece of originality there that will stay with the car for the remainder of its life. Now we'll lift the car up and we'll have a bit of a look underneath. It's not until you've got one of these cars up on a hoist that you really appreciate the level of engineering and effort that goes in to make a successful V8 supercar. Now there's way too much to cover in one video, but I'll quickly show a couple of things now if I'll share these with you, which are really cool. The exhaust system on BA1 is totally different to the super cheap Auto Falcon and FTR3. Now, if you have a look here at the bell housing, the, this bell housing is custom built by Stones. So you can see they've built in this massive recess to it and the recess goes up as high as the input shaft of the gearbox. So all that space there is not wasted. And by recessing that all in, the exhaust system of the car and the collectors can sit directly under the bell housing. So what that does, as far as I know, and I'm not an expert, is you get more weight over the left-hand side of the car to compensate for your driver. And you also don't have, which most of the cars had, the exhaust system coming straight under here, then cutting across to the side. And by having your exhaust system here, it's directly under your driver. So you have a massive heat soak up under the seat, up under the pedal box. And you know it's well known that the supercars are extremely hot to drive. So that's a really cool piece of engineering and it would have taken a lot to get that all to fit because you can see the tolerances are next to nothing. Now, if we go back over here, just to have a quick look at the, the systems off the cars. So this is the exhaust system off FTR3 and you can see it's more of a standardized system. So you've got your left-hand bank of the engine and the right-hand bank of the engine and they go through the collectors into the exhaust, through the mufflers and out the left-hand side of the car. Now you have a look at, this is the exhaust system off BA1 and you can see the collectors are right next to each other because of that bell housing modification. It goes through a set of mufflers and out. So you have a look at the size of the FPR or FTR system compared to the stone system. It's a completely different way of thinking and it's a really cool piece of uh, engineering. Now you have a look at the exhaust system on the super cheap auto falcon it's exits left and right uh, to me you can't beat that purely because it throws flames out of both sides of the car but from a performance uh, point of view it's probably not what they're chasing now one other thing i'll quickly cover under here as well you may recall if you've been following the story the bell housing on the super cheap auto falcon was built into an oil tank and there's the bell housing for the engine not just a standard bell housing it's fully custom built and what they've done is they've built it in to become the oil tank for the car for the engine so you couldn't actually shorten it up like what stone brothers have done here but the oil tank in ftr3 is in the boot what stones have done with this car is they run the oil lines the full length of the car so it goes through the transmission tunnel alongside the tail shaft and the oil tanks actually at the back of the car and you can see here it's been placed up right next to the diff and the diff housing. So it's really low. It's, I don't know how they've got it in there, but they managed. And so you've got a whole heap of weight and the oil storage of the engine at the back of the car to compensate for the engine. And also it's on the left-hand side to compensate for your driver. And it's really low in the car so you don't have this pendulum effect of all this weight sloshing around at the back of the car. You can see the battery's really low as well. And it's just the way they've done it and everything is just keep it low and keep it more centralized to the car. Now this last piece here is seriously impressive. Now, if you look at this footage, when Stone Brothers rolled this car out at the start of 2003, both BA2 and BA1, they made a big effort to cover up the back of the car. Now, obviously there was a reason for that. They wouldn't just do it, uh, do it to be uh, just for something to do. So what, I understand it as being is if you have a look at the fuel cell on the car it's a long way forward and if you compare it to the other two cars it's it's a long way from the rear rails now how have they done that because you've still got to get the watts linkage and the diff and everything all in there as per blue uh, blueprint regulations now this is the watts linkage out of FTR3 so it's a big piece it's quite thick but you couldn't really couldn't make that any thinner and make it work 
or make it any lighter. If you have a look at BA1, if we come up here and have a look, it's probably it's a bit hard to show here actually, but the, the watts linkage is jammed in there. And if we follow that around, so that's the watts there all covered in grease and oil, but it's been cut in half and it's been recessed into the diff housing. So it's really hard to show you, but the diff housing has been modified as such. So the watts linkage is recessed right next to the crown wheel and pinion. So again, it brings the watts linkage forward. It compresses the whole system. The fuel cell can come forward. And again, you don't have this pendulum of effect of all the fuel at the back of the car sloshing around, destabilizing the back of the car. So you have a look at how they've managed to get the diff, the watts linkage, the fuel tank, everything in that tiny little bit of space there is just unbelievable. And you have a look at you know oil tank, diff, battery, that whole section at the back of the car is low, it's light, and it's all in the minimal space possible and closest to the center of the car as you could possibly have it. So just little things like that, I'm really looking forward to getting in there and investigating further, just seeing how it was all done. Obviously, we've got to pull all this out. Everything needs to be well serviced. It's all filthy. And a lot of it, like even the roll bar adjusters are seized because they've been sitting so long. So um, there's a lot to do under here and I guess make some decisions now. I alluded earlier in the video about some d damage and bits and pieces that we need to look into. If you have a look, what I'm alluding to is if you go underneath the car here, you can see it's had a tail shaft failure. It's had one there, and it's also done a heap of damage at the back when it's failed and torn a hole in the floor. So it, it raises the question, do we cut this section of floor out and repair it? and then just paint that section inside the car? Do we leave it? Is it part of the car's history? It's all these questions that we need to, I guess, find answers to, and we only get one go at it, so we've got to make sure that they're the right ones. Given that it's got a hole in it, we probably need to do something, whether we just repair as minimal amount as we can. It has got a patch over it inside the car at the minute, so it's not ideal. Um, as I said, it's just a really a, a question of, do we need to make it look like it or have it how it was when it was new or do we need to preserve the history that's there so it's a bit of an interesting conundrum but we'll uh i guess we'll go through it as we go so as you can see car nine's got plenty of stories to tell that's just a snippet of what we found so far there's way too much to try and cram it all into one update so as we go we'll document it and then we'll put them together in regular updates on the car as far as car 31 goes, we're hoping that they will return to the track shortly. We've done just a few little tidy up jobs on this car over the last week or so. And then basically this car, the next step will be, it's, uh, it's run on a dyno, then a track. And car five, similar story. We're just gotta, I guess it's just sitting idle for the moment while we work out the, uh, the fabrication side of things with that. So, so while that takes place, we'll uh, get some information together on the Stone Brothers Falcon and uh, we'll have some content on all three cars as they progress along. So thanks again for your interest and support. If you've got any questions, please let us know and we'll speak with you soon.